<laughs> Kelly was so organized and she did that whole thing with telling you what she was answering. I've approached this more like an undergraduate essay. <laughs> I decided to just kind of write about what I was feeling about, and I'm going to leave you to figure out what question I'm answering when. <laughs> Patricia Limerick, in ushering in the new Western history, urged us to recognize the West not as a time period bracketed by the opening and closing of the frontier, as dictated by Turner, but as a dynamic place where multiple cultural and language groups came together to negotiate life in a difficult environment. For Limerick, the West is a real place. For me, the West is simultaneously a real and an imaginary place. The imaginary West was born of the young American nation's dreams, ambitions, fears, and tensions. The imaginary West, continuously created and recreated through time, becomes a space for multiple, sometimes competing, mythologies. It is peopled by mythic versions of the peoples who settled there, the indigenous peoples, the settlers, the cowboys, the military, the miners, etc. Through the study of material culture, historical archaeology has the unique ability to study both the embodied experience of life in the West and the ways that Americans, including Westerners themselves, actively sought to situate themselves in these narratives. As an example, uh, Katrina Eichner, Aaron Rodriguez, and myself are conducting research at Fort Davis, Texas, to study the lives of the Black Regulars, also known as the Buffalo Soldiers. Black military infantry and cavalry regiments formed during the Civil War were initially used to enforce reconstruction policies in the South, but resulting in civil unrest and violence led Congress to send these troops west of the Mississippi River. Writing from Fort Davis in January of 1877, George Mullins, chaplain of the 25th Infantry, noted, the ambition to be all that soldiers should be is not confined to a few members of this unfortunate race. They are possessed of the notion that the colored people of the whole country are more or less affected by their conduct in the Army. The one looks at Fort Davis's geographic location, both in the 19th century and today. Is there a little thing? Yes. There's Fort Davis. You will see that it is approximately 100 miles south of the middle of nowhere. <laughs> this up here is the middle of the well, You can see it. The men stationed at Fort Davis were involved in guarding mail trains, building roads, and laying telegraph lines. Despite the seeming geographic isolation and mundane work, the black soldiers, in the words of Mullins, were possessed of the notion that what they did in the military mattered a great deal to their race. And they were correct. The troops recognized that they were inhabitants of an important landscape, the imaginary lands of the West. Not the West as a lived, embodied geographic place, but the West, as existed then in American mythology. By pushing black troops onto the frontier, Congress gave soldiers instant mythic status back east. How they positioned themselves in those mythic stories had the possibility to shape national discourses on quality and citizenship rights for all African Americans. Depending on political affiliation, region, and audience, the newspapers touted black regulars as ignorant savages who used their status as soldiers to terrorize the public and rape white women or as enlightened exemplars of manhood and their race. Black troops saw the West as a proving ground, a well-publicized proving ground. News from remote places like Fort Davis spread east and west along telegraph lines built by Buffalo soldiers, trumpeting both black successes and failures. Archaeological materials recovered from Fort Davis reveal the soldiers embraced the West as a place where men can recreate themselves. As early as 1867, men were using military service to forge what it was to be free black men and U.S. citizens. While standard military issue was limited to tin plates and tin cups, the barracks artifacts included inkwells, plain gothic tablewares, teawares, and chamberwares. Fort Davis commissary records show that the black companies regularly sold surplus rations to purchase spelling books, wash basins, knives, forks, spoons, and goblets. We see in these purchases not only an interest in education, but also a concern for the material trappings of middle-class manly gentility. 
black soldiers position themselves ideologically and materially as part of the civilizing forces on the frontier, and in doing so directly confronted stereotypes of African American men and savages. These were men who employed the opportunities of both the real and the imagined West to create an alternate representation of black manhood. There is a boundary, we can debate whether it's the water or the land, to the West, at least on the continental sea. This is the problem with going after James. <laughs> the Pacific coast represents an end, a particular end to the West. And before I edited this down, I had a wonderful section about tiki bars and how Californians use tiki bars to look to a different imaginary West, but that, that got edited out. But imagine it. <laughs> the Pacific Coast is an edge, and it's an edge where I've done most of my research. This is a place that has long captured the American imagination. Hollywood often gives voice to a complex set of mythologies and worries that focus on this western edge. The city across the bay from my campus features prominently in these narratives. San Francisco, the city built by the gold rush, depending on the story, is the future home of Starfleet Academy, will be destroyed by genetically engineered apes or kaiju, or will be saved by a benevolent Godzilla. These stories that we tell are just part of a continuing tradition. In my research on this western edge, I've been continuously struck by how self-conscious Californians have been through time and material materially positioning themselves within Western mythologies. In 1870, California, exactly 1,402 miles west of Fort Davis, the first generation of University of California students wrote in newspapers and yearbooks about their great responsibility to aid in the civilizing of California. They competed with one another to create the most innovative traditions for the new university. They imagined the Harvard of the West. The fraternity of Zeta Psi boasted being the first fraternity west of the Mississippi, while archaeology shows its, its members embraced the same material emblems and practices of Victorian manliness employed by the black soldiers at Fort Davis. While brothers in the 1870s drew on the trope of civilizing the West, in the 1880s, the brothers of Zeta Psi sought to save the West. Influenced by environmentalists like John Murr, they aided in the creation of the Sierra Club. By the 1890s, when the Indian Wars ended and Turner proclaimed the frontier closed, the natural environment of the West remained a masculine proving ground for hunting and mountaineering. Sigma Psi brothers were among those who scaled mountaintops and embarked on hunting trips, bringing wild game back to campus to cook and tossing it in their yard, and using Native American and Mexican materials in their household decor. Notably, at the 50th anniversary of the university's founding, brothers from the 1870s, those civilizers, returned to campus and were interviewed about their experiences as students. The men who wrote passionately about the joys of civilization as students chose to tell stories not of the bait clubs and Victorian tablewares, but rather of horseback riding, fights with rattlesnakes, and the ruggedness of their California. Good storytellers, they altered the stories of their past to appeal to the younger generation's ideas of the imaginary West. While many of the myths of the West were masculine, that did not prevent women from evoking Western mythologies for their own agendas. Helen Hunt Jackson's 1884 novel, Ramona, detailing abuses in the California missions experienced by Native Californians, became in the 1920s and 30s a source for an alternate and certainly unintended by Hunt. California mythology, one in which romanticized Spanish women and men lived a genteel and civilized life of fiestas and parties at the civilized edge of the West. In the 1930s, the women of Casa de España, it really was a female boarding house. <laughs> it was a themed student boarding house at Cal, embraced the Ramona mythology. Women spoke Spanish to one another while dining off of Fiesta wears, clearly an excellent influence, ceramic. The West has been and remains an important imaginary landscape in the American psyche. It is an imaginary space in which citizenship rights are contested, established, and reified, and debates over national patrimony and natural resources continue. It's an imaginary space that demands excavation. Thank you.